shuffling about the room. That's nice. Well, uh, you know, today we're going to talk about danger. There are many dangerous things in our world. There are some things that are obviously dangerous. There are some things that are obviously dangerous, um, but you got to do them anyway. There are some things that are obviously dangerous that you should never do. Um, For example, um, fighting a war. Some of you have experienced that fighting in a war is dangerous. Um, And it's obvious that that's a dangerous thing to do. Um, there, There are some snakes that are dangerous. In my mind, they're all dangerous. But I know some of you out there are probably... Uh, you know, snake people, and and I realize, uh, to me, I just, I run like a child when I see a snake. Jumping out of an airplane is dangerous. We had two men from our church, in order to make a a point at Disciple Now, they jumped out of an airplane on purpose uh, with a parachute, and the youth got to see that video. Um, I was on the, I did not go up in the plane, I was on the ground, uh, and I was uh, just thinking they were foolish. Um, There are some things that are dangerous you should never do. Uh, Texting and driving, that's one. It's so tempting. It's so tempting. But if you think about it, a car is basically like a bomb. And you're driving it 70 miles an hour down the road. You should never stare at a phone. Um, It's incredibly foolish and, and it's dangerous. Or, I mean, honestly, driving in Austin during rush hour is dangerous. Um, it's, it's dangerous. Uh, giving your wife a vacuum cleaner for Valentine's Day. I didn't do that. That's not from experience. I said there are some things that are obvious. That would be one of the obvious things that you do not do. Unless it's like one of those really expensive ones that does all the sweeping for you. Um, maybe that. Uh, but there are some things that are dangerous that are not so obvious, and so they require a warning. You've seen a warning label. I I brought some examples, some dangerous things. Um, We'll put them on the screen. The first one, um, that's that's a washing machine. It says, high spin speeds, do not put any person in this washer. (laughs) I didn't know. I didn't know. Um, If it was low speed, maybe, but... I didn't know, so you needed, you needed the warning label there. Or, or the next one. Um, these peanuts, warning, they contain peanuts. So if you're allergic to peanuts, you should not eat these peanuts. Okay? Um, it's important to have the, the warning label. Or what about this one? This is a hair straightener. It says eye contact warning for this straightening iron. You should not shove this in your eye. It's very hot. And here's the thing about these warning labels is that someone has done this thing and sued and won. So the company had to make this warning label uh, for people. Or or what about this one? These are iron-on letters that you can get and you can make your own t-shirt kind of thing. It says, do not iron while wearing shirt. Once again, someone has done this. They thought, I'll put the letters on my shirt and then start ironing. And then they sued and won millions of dollars. So um, one more, one more. This is a, uh, the fuel tank cover for your car. I think it's a car. It says unscrew cap, turning counterclockwise to allow fuel tank filling. Fully tighten when finished. That makes sense. Okay, now I know how to unscrew this. But then it says, warning, never use a lit match or open flame to check fuel level. (laughs) Someone has done this. It will explode if you do that. Be warned. There are things that are dangerous, but maybe not so obvious and require a warning. Well, this morning we're going to talk about one of those things. This morning, we're going to talk about the danger of prayer, and it it comes with a warning label. So if you've got a Bible, you can turn to Matthew 6. We're going to pick up there here in a second, Matthew chapter 6. And Matthew chapter 6 is right in the middle of uh, what is known as the Sermon on the Mount. And, And people who have never read the Bible before have probably heard something out of the Sermon on the Mount. 
Judge not, lest ye be judged yourself. That's that Sermon on the Mount. Treat others the way that you want to be treated. That's Sermon on the Mount. Uh, the meek shall inherit the earth. That, that's Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is full of things like that. It's a collection of sayings um, of Jesus. Things Jesus used to say as he went around and he preached. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is. Now when we read the Sermon on the Mount, it's important for us to kind of get it, get it right though. Because... Um, My tendency is to read this and think, well, the Sermon on the Mount is like a list of rules. It's like a behavioral checklist. If I can do this and this and this and this, if I can do these things, then God will accept me. Then I'll earn the favor of God if I can keep this checklist. But that's not the Sermon on the Mount. It's not a behavioral checklist. It's more like a description. It's a description of citizens of the kingdom of God. So if you want to know what citizens of the kingdom of God should be like, you read the Sermon on the Mount, that's what they should be like. You trust in Jesus and you're saved by faith alone. You're saved by by putting your trust in him only and his work on the cross. And then the Holy Spirit starts to make your life look like the Sermon on the Mount. But it's not really a behavioral checklist to earn God's favor. Well, right in the Sermon on, right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, is something that you've probably heard before. Right in the middle, almost as if to say, this is the most important thing. Everything's important, but this right here in the middle is the most important. Do you know what's right at the middle? It's the Lord's Prayer. Right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount is the Lord's Prayer. And that's really, really important. Jesus taught us how to pray. Now, over the next couple of weeks in our ABFs, we're going to be learning, uh, we're going to spend two weeks learning about the Lord's Prayer and how it should inform the way that we pray. Um, and so I won't, I won't spend any real time talking about the Lord's Prayer today because you're going to get it for two weeks. But what I want to do today is I, I want to back up and I want to give you a little bit of context about the Lord's Prayer. I want to show you what, why did Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount start with the Lord's Prayer? What What was he talking about when he did that? That's what we're going to look at today in Matthew chapter 6 where we're going to pick up. Now we're we're right in the middle of of 40 days of prayer. I mean we started last week. If you missed last week, you're wondering what's going on. We started 40 days of prayer. Our church is committing ourselves to prayer, to learning to pray, to devoting ourselves to this idea of, of communicating with God. Now, I know sometimes we, we talk about prayer and we say, well, prayer is communication with God. And, and for a lot of you, you're like, yeah, I get it. Can we move on? Can we talk about something else? We know about prayer. And I think that's because things that are familiar are easy to forget about. I think you'd agree with me that things that are familiar are easy to forget about. Like, let me give you some examples. Eyebrows are kind of like, they're kind of weird if you think about it, right? Are you with me? Like, okay, this might be dangerous. Look at the person next to you and look at their eyebrows. Do it. Okay, if you don't like those, look at the person on the other side. Look at their eyebrows. Okay. Now, you can't unnotice. Now, now you're like looking around at people's eyebrows. My eyebrows are like four feet long on the screen. You're, you're, you're noticing eyebrows. They're kind of weird. They're just like hair in the middle of your face. I know they serve a purpose. That's fine. But it's kind of weird But we forget, we don't notice. There's hair in the middle of that person's face. We don't notice it because it's familiar. Okay, here's another one. Laughing is is a weird thing. It's weird. When somebody tells a joke, what what do you do? You open your mouth and you make a noise. Some of you make really strange noises. Other people say, ha, ha, ha. Um, Some some people like open their mouth and make no no noise. I don't understand that one. Uh, But laughing is weird. You think something's funny, so you open your mouth and make these involuntary noises. But we don't notice when somebody laughs because it's familiar. I'll give you one more, okay? Yawning is really weird. So when you're tired, when you're sleepy, what your body decides to do is open your mouth and make a Chewbacca noise. Like, why is that a thing? You can't just say, I'm tired. You have to make a noise. That's weird. But we don't notice. Like, some of you are already sleepy, and you're already yawning, and people aren't turning to look at you like, what are you doing? Um, Because it's so familiar. We forget things that are familiar. We forget things that are familiar, and we do that with the things of God all over the place. 
one of those areas that we do that is with prayer. We forget what an amazing thing prayer is. What an amazing thing. We say, well, prayer is communication with God. Let's move on. No, no, no. Prayer is communication with God, the creator of all things. The the God who spoke things into being wants to communicate with you, have a conversation. That's what prayer is. And so what we want to do over these 40 days is, is, is not just kind of ho-hum prayer, let's move on, prayer, prayers like eyebrows, they don't matter. No, no, no. We, we want to devote ourselves to this thing called prayer. And so Matthew chapter 6, I promise we're getting there. I told you a long time ago to turn there. Some of you look confused, so I was stalling. I'm just kidding. Um, Matthew chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 1. All right, we're going to start in verse 1, and verse 1 of Matthew chapter 6 is a summary for what's to come, and I'll show you what I mean. Look in verse 1. It says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Okay, that verse right there, Matthew 6, 1, is a summary for what Jesus is about to say. Now, we're not going to spend time talking about all the following verses, but if you were to ask a first century Jew, um, how do you know that a person is righteous? What are the things that they do? What are the pious deeds? They would have said, well, they give to the poor when they pray and they fast. And so what Jesus is going to do in this little section of the Sermon on the Mount is he says, beware of, of practicing your righteousness in front of others in order to be seen by them. And that applies to your giving, that applies to your praying, and that ap- applies to your fasting. And that, that's kind of how this little section is structured. Okay, but he says, beware. Beware. When you see a beware sign, what does that cause you to do? If you're smart, it makes you watch out. It heightens your awareness. It causes you to pay attention when you see a beware sign. When, uh, when I, in my younger days, I, uh, I, am I old enough to say that yet? I, in my younger days, I had the opportunity, when I was um, finishing up college, I had the opportunity to coach uh, seventh grade football at a middle school in Bryan, Rayburn Middle School in, in Bryan. And I was one of the coaches. I don't know anything about football, so I was not like the head coach. We'd have been in trouble. I was one of the coaches. But one of the things we used to teach the kids is this phrase. We would say, keep your head on a swivel. Keep your head on a swivel. Because here's the thing. This, this is true about all football, but in seventh grade, that's the weird, uh, weird time period where you have a kid that's like this tall. And then we had a kid on our team named Kelvin that was 6'4". And so we tell this little kid right here, little Johnny, hey, little Johnny, keep your head on a swivel. That means don't just keep your eyes focused right here. You got to look. You got to look. You know why? Kelvin's coming. You better watch out. That dude's going to take your head off, right? Keep your head on a swivel. Beware. Beware. There's danger afoot. His name is Kelvin and he's 6'4" right? But beware. That's what that means. Pay attention. But Jesus says, beware. Be careful. Pay attention. Keep your head on a swivel. There is danger. There is danger. And the danger is that you would practice your righteousness so that other people will see you and think that you're so great. That's the danger that is there. That's the danger that Jesus is pointing out. And so he's going to talk about the danger in practicing your righteousness in front of people as it applies to giving. And we're not really going to talk about giving today because this isn't 40 days of giving. This is 40 days of prayer. But what he says is, sound no trumpet when you're giving to the poor. And if I was sitting in that sermon, I'd have laughed. That's funny. Like just imagining somebody like playing a trumpet. Hey, everybody, look what I'm doing. I'm giving to the poor. Sound no trumpet. And then he says, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Now, obviously, that's not something you can actually do. That, that's, that's like figurative language to help you understand. Um, give in secret. Turn your check over. Don't tell anybody what you're doing. Give in secret. Don't, don't let other people know what you're doing. Don't practice your righteousness so every, everybody will notice and pat you on the back. Okay? Um, that's giving, but we're not talking about giving. We're, we're going we're gonna to talk about prayer. We're going to talk about prayer. And what we're going to find 
as we look at these verses together, is that God rewards prayers that are sincere and prayers that are simple. God rewards prayers that are sincere and prayers that are simple. So let's look together, starting in verse 5, Matthew chapter 6. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand And pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door. And pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. See, God rewards prayers that are sincere. When I look at these two verses, I notice a couple of things. The first thing that I notice is he says, when you pray. Not if, when you pray. See, it it is not a suggestion. It is not an option that you pray. It is a requirement of those who would follow Jesus. People who call themselves citizens of the kingdom of God will pray. They will. And then what Jesus does is he contrasts his disciples with what he calls hypocrites. Don't be like the hypocrites when you pray. Now, what is a hypocrite? You know, a hypocrite is is somebody who says one thing but does another. Somebody who everybody perceives to be one way, but really they're another way. Or somebody who acts a certain way in public, but in private there's somebody completely different. That's a hypocrite. And it's easy for us to point our fingers at hypocrites. And there, there are some people, there are some people who would say, maybe you're sitting in the room right now who would say, I can't be a part of a church. They're too full of hypocrites, right? And a little sidebar, I think we're all hypocrites. I, I think, I think there are good hypocrites and there are bad hypocrites, right? <laughs> the bad hypocrites are, well, let's we'll say the good hypocrites are the ones who say, I am a hypocrite. I'm, I'm the one who says that these are the things that are important in my life, but then you go over here and you can say, well, that action you had doesn't really match up with what you said, and that action doesn't really match up with what you said. That makes me a hypocrite. I think we're all hypocrites. This church is a full of hypocrites. Those people are right. But that's not a reason why you shouldn't be a part of a church. You know? I think we're all hypocrites, but I think Jesus is ref- referencing here like the bad hypocrites. The, 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 ones, the ones who act one way in public, but there's somebody completely different in private. He says, don't be like them. What, what is it that they do that bothers Jesus? He says, uh, they love to pray in, in the synagogue. Like when they go to church, they love to be called on. Man, I hope he calls on me to pray because I'm, I'm going to wow them with my prayer. They're going to pat me on the back. Everyone's going to stand and applaud when I'm done praying. Jesus says they love to do that. They love to pray on the street corner. What that's about is first century Jews would have understood this. They would have understood that um, in the, if you were in Jerusalem, uh, in the afternoon, there was an afternoon sacrifice. And when the afternoon sacrifice was taking place, they would blow some trumpets. And if you heard the trumpet, you were supposed to stop drop and pray. That's what you were supposed to do when you heard the afternoon sacrifice taking place. Stop, drop, and pray. Well, what Jesus is kind of referencing here is he's saying, um, these hypocrites, what they do is they love it when they're in public when those horns blow. They love it. In fact, they may even plan their afternoon around it. Like, I'm going to go get some lunch, then I'm going to go take care of this, and then I'm going to find the most crowded spot I can in downtown Jerusalem. And wait for that trumpet to blow. And when it does, I'm going to get to my knees the fastest. And I'm going to pray the loudest. And I'm going to be the most eloquent. And when I'm done, everyone's going to applaud me for the prayer that I gave. And Jesus says those people are hypocrites. They are hypocrites. They're hypocrites because they give the appearance of holiness, but their hearts are wicked. Their eyes are not turned towards God, but towards the applause of men. And Jesus says in the text, he says, well, they'll have their reward. They're going to be rewarded. But what they're hoping for 
is applause, the accolades of men. And they are, they're hoping that they'll be cheered and congratulated and celebrated. And Jesus says, yep, they're going to get all of that. They're going to be congratulated and cheered and celebrated. They're going to get all of those things, but nothing else. There will be no reward for them from their father. Jesus says, don't be like that. If a prayer is blind to God, then God will be blind to that prayer. Don't be like that, Jesus says. He says, let me show you how to pray. See, hypocrites love to be seen. Disciples don't don't care if they're seen. Hypocrites have one eye focused on the accolades of men and maybe one eye towards God, but disciples have both eyes fixed on their father. And so Jesus says, don't be like them. Instead, he says, pray in secret. Pray in secret. Maybe some of your translations say, uh, go into your closet. Go into your closet. That doesn't mean that this is not a command for a prayer closet. So if you have a prayer closet, or a place you like to go pray, awesome. But this is not like a biblical mandate that every single one of us should redesign our homes to have prayer closets. That's not what this text is is telling us. This is more like the um, don't let one hand know what the other one is doing. Um, It's figurative language. Go into your inner room. Um, what, What this is communicating to us is that public prayer is good, private prayer is better. Um, Moses, Daniel, Ezra, the apostles, even Jesus himself prayed publicly. It's not wrong to pray in public. It's good to pray in public. But private prayer is better. Because in private, there's no limit to time, no danger of the public eye. You can be alone and express yourself to God. You can ask questions. You can wait for that answer. You can, you can groan, you can, you can weep, you can sit in silence. You don't have to worry about other people becoming bored with your prayer or wondering if you might be a weirdo. You don't have to do that. You're by yourself. And so Jesus says, pray in secret. Because when you pray in secret, you can pray sincerely. You can pray to your Father And it is in the sincerity made by solitude that your prayer will be rewarded. Your father will hear your prayer and he will respond. See, God rewards prayers that are sincere. God also rewards prayers that are simple. God rewards prayers that are simple. Look with me in verse 7 of Matthew chapter 6. Jesus says, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Once again, Jesus begins with the word, when you pray. When not if. It is an expectation. Some of you might be saying like, I, sometimes I don't feel like praying. I just don't feel like it. I'm in a dry season. And I would tell you that, that ritualistic dry prayer is better than no prayer at all. Just do it. It is the expectation of the master that you pray. He says, when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. When he says the word Gentiles, he really means people who don't know God. Like people who don't know God, they heap up these empty phrases thinking that they can convince God. That reminds me of this story in 1 Kings. And maybe you've heard it before. There's going to be a contest between the prophets of Baal and and really the one prophet, Elijah. Who's the one true God? And the way the contest works is each prophet's going to get a chance to pray. And whichever God sends down fire on the altar, that's the one true God. And so you have this image of these prophets of Baal. They're shouting all day long. And and they're cutting themselves and and bleeding. And they're invoking their God's name over and over and over, hoping to rouse him and gain his attention. We have records of of ancient prayers from people, um, these ancient pagan people that, that are praying in the name of many gods. 
Like they're just listing all the different gods they can think of in case one of them might hear and, and pay attention to them. They're just heaping up empty phrases, trying to gain whatever attention they can. I wonder though, I mean, I don't, I don't see anybody shouting or cutting themselves or, or anything like that in here. Um, but I wonder if, if there are ways that we heap up empty phrases. Like I think about mindless repetition. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for what you've given us. Thank you for the food we're about to eat. Thank you for the trees and the animals. And That's empty and mindless. And maybe we teach our kids to pray that way as we're instructing them, but, but is there a way that we are mindless in our prayer? I remember when I was a kid, I went to this church in San Antonio, um, and there was this faithful old man. Oh, he was, he was this, this saint, but he was old, like really old. Uh, and, and he was a deacon, and he, I'm telling you, he was a godly man, and he loved Jesus. But we dreaded it when he was asked to pray for the offering. Because this guy would get up there and he would go on and on. And I'll never forget one day I was a kid. He, <laughs> he said, uh, before the offering, right? The offering goes before the sermon. Then there's going to be a sermon and then we're going to sing a song or two. And then we're going to leave. That, that's the deal. Well, he's praying and he's going on and on and on. And all of a sudden he says, and Lord, thank you for this food we're about to eat. And I'm like, are there snacks? Like, what's going on here? What's going on? Well, He's a godly man. I'm not slamming him at all, but that's an example of mindless repetition. We're just saying words. We're not really thinking about what we're saying. That, that's heaping up this, these prayers, these empty phrases like the people who don't know God do. Or another way I think that we do this is by using language that isn't our normal language. Oh, thine great Jehovah. Jehovah, right? Thee, thou, thy. Like, you don't talk like that. And God's not, like, from Victorian England. Like, he, he's, you don't have to talk to him that way, unless that's how you normally talk. But that's a way that we do that. Just, just talk to him in your normal voice, your normal accent, your normal choice of words. That, that's empty phrases. Another example I think of empty phrases is just trying to convince God. Just trying to impress him. Thinking that if I can just say this the right way, then he'll have to answer me. And, and so you try and you try and you try to get it just right. If I don't get it just right, then God won't hear me. Or if I get it just right, then he'll have to respond. Right? That's empty phrases. That, that's not what God wants. We don't have to convince God. We don't have to impress him with our language and knowledge of Victorian English. We don't have to impress him. Why? It tells us at the end of verse 8. Your father knows what you need before you ask him. He knows what you need before you ask. So ju just go talk to your father. Just go tell him what you need. You don't have to get it right. You don't have to say the right words. You don't have to convince him that you really need it. He knows what you need before you even ask one of my favorite parts of scripture is a description of Moses. And if you were reading, reading the Old Testament, you might just breeze right over it. But every time I see this description as I'm reading, I, I got to pause. Moses was leading the people of Israel out of Egypt, and they're kind of in between the promised land and Egypt, and he's leading them around, and they've got this big camp of people, and, and in the, at just, just outside the camp, there's this place called the Tent of Meeting, and that's where Moses would go talk to God. Nobody else, maybe Aaron could go, Moses' brother, but, but nobody else was allowed to go talk to God. But what, this, what the scripture says is that Moses, it says, Moses would go out there, and he would talk to God like a man talks to his friend. That gets me every time. Like, what? Is that what God wants? Does he want me to talk to him like he's my friend? And I don't mean in a disrespectful way. Now, he's, he's the king, right? We, we don't speak to him disrespectfully, but, but just, just kind of telling him, like, I, I don't have to speak formally. I, I don't have to, to get it just right. I don't have to impress him. I can just tell him. Like I would tell a friend or like I would tell my dad. That, that, that's amazing to me. You don't have to impress God with your words. So then how should we pray? And that's, that's where this comes in. Our Father in heaven. 
hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's what Jesus says. He's just pray something like that. Just pray something like that. Simple. God rewards prayers that are simple. You don't have to be impressive. So God rewards prayers that are sincere. God rewards prayers that are simple. The danger in prayer, though, here, here's the warning. Here's the danger that we would spend our time praying, but God wouldn't listen. We would devote ourselves to 40 days of prayer, and at the end of all of it, God would pay no attention to us, and he would ignore us. To me, that, that would be the biggest waste. That, that would be the train wreck right there. So how do we ensure God will listen? Who does God pay attention to? It's not a mystery. The Bible tells us. God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 66. And he says this. He says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me? What is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made, and so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. Here's what God says in the first part of this verse. Here's what he says. Heaven is my throne. Look up. Look at the sky. Look at the stars. The the people who are hearing this for the first time, they they don't even have the understanding of of what's up in the heavens like we do. They They didn't understand what stars are. We do. God says, the heavens are nothing. I sit on them. They're my throne. Well, look at the earth. The power, the might, the majesty, important people, strong people, impressive people, all of your problems, big and small, all of those things, the mighty mountains and all of creation. Look at the earth. That's my footstool. All those things that look big and mighty and strong and powerful and impressive to you, that's where I rest my feet. They're minuscule and small to me. So he says, heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. And this is the one to whom I will look. Here's the one I'm going to pay attention to. Here's the one I'm going to... Turn my gaze towards. This is the one that catches my attention. Surely it's got to be the mighty man, the one that's strong, the one mighty in battle or the courageous warrior. Or or maybe it's the impressive person who gets all the pats on the back and all the applause from people. Maybe that's the one that catches the gaze of God. Or maybe it's the smart person, the, the person who knows everything or the eloquent person who can say things just right. Who catches the gaze of God? Isaiah 66 verse 2 tells us, this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Humility draws the gaze of God. God pays attention to the prayers of humble people, not impressive people, not eloquent people, not the ones with the most pats on the back. God turns his gaze towards those who understand who they are and who God is, and they humble themselves, and they pray with sincerity, not to impress people, and they pray simply not to impress God. So here's... Here's how we're going to wrap up today. We're going to have a time of response. And here's what we're going to do. Um, Usually when you get in a big group like this, we we want to say pray together, like get in groups and pray. We're not doing that today. What what we're going to do is we're going to take just a few moments, and I want you just to kind of sit where you're at. The worship team's going to come, and they're going to start a song. But you, you just sit right where you're at in your chair, and I want you to speak to your father. Speak to your father. Not out loud. The person next to you will hear you. I want you just just to yourself. Speak to your father. Tell him what's on your heart. What's making you worry? What's dragging you down? What's the first thing on your mind when I say, do you have something I can pray for you about? And you've, you've got something, whether you share it or not. You've got something. Maybe it's a temptation you're struggling with. But we're just gonna take a few moments and I want you to pray to your father. 
right where you're at. It doesn't have to be long. Sincerely, simply pray. And the other thing that I want you to do walking out of here is, is while you're sitting there, I want you to make a plan. Let me put it this way. I want you to set an appointment with your father this week, every day. Starting today, all the way through next Saturday, set an appointment with your father where you're gonna speak to him sincerely, simply, in solitude. A great place to get solitude is in your car with the radio off. Maybe if you're tra- traveling to work, that could be your appointment with your father. But I want you to s- schedule an appointment with your father right now. Figure it out and speak to your father about what's on your heart. And we're gonna do so in silence and then the band is gonna lead us in a couple of songs. Please don't move, please don't leave. Speak to your father. Let's pray. Thank you.